and I am very glad to be here with you all. Thank you for inviting me to share God's Word with you. And I want to share a message today that has really touched my heart a little bit and more for you as well. Could I pray with you all before we start? Our Father in Heaven, I just want to say thank you for the Bible and the fact that it is here to give us comfort and guidance. May it do that today. May you just bring it to life by the power of your Holy Spirit and apply it to each and every one of us here today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Part of our culture that is arguably an enormous part of our culture is uh, the cinema, the movie industry. And there are quite a few movies that make a lot of money. Two of them happen to be pretty similar. The fifth and seventh highest grossing films of all time have Avenger in the title. Did you know that? The Avengers, so to speak. They happen to be movies about superheroes who come to protect people, to save the world, to do great things for people who can't do them themselves. And I thought to myself, I wonder why these are some of the highest grossing movies of all time. Thank you. He's taking care of me. This is a good guy right here. <laughs> and I wondered to myself, why would these be some of the highest grossing movies of all time? And I thought about what a lot of us have to deal with. If we were to take a show of hands of any one of us who have been wronged at some point, I imagine that probably all of our hands would go up. Wronged in some manner. And when you're wronged, do you really feel very good about it? I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're better than I am, but I don't feel very good about it. And sometimes, in fact, I feel quite sad. Or maybe I might feel quite angry. And I want justice. I want the wrong to be righted. Is this not the right place? Yeah, right a little here. closer. Closer? Okay. I'll get it together. We'll see. It's right there. We want the wrong to be righted. We want the wrong to be righted. And it's almost a universal response to have a wrong right. And if it's not working, I can talk loud. So don't you worry about it. We'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Well, I was told that it was only muted in the back. I tell you what. Um, here we go. I think it's on, guys. I think it's on. <laughs> Technology is awesome until it's not. Is it? Now it's great again. Okay, we've got it. All right. Thank you, Lord. Okay. When we have a wrong against us, we long for justice, don't we? Justice to be done. But the problem is, is those films that are so greatly loved by so many people are all fictional. Uh, no one's going to jump off the movie screen and actually save you and bring you justice. No. You see, we long for justice, but that's not the way we're going to get it. You see, many people in the Bible as well wanted to be avenged for wrongs done to them, because the Bible is a real book, friends. The Bible doesn't pull punches. It talks about the lives of people, and all of its start in very uncomfortable reality. And people were wronged. Yes. People were wronged very horribly sometimes. And one of the folks today that I want to highlight, I want us to jump right into the middle of his story, is somebody that you know well. It's David. And we're going to pick up his story in 1 Samuel 25, chapter 25. I imagine that in this story, he had been contemplating very seriously his recent run-in with Saul, who was king of Israel at that time, who had just had uh, an experience with in the previous chapter, 24. 
and how he had spared his life in that cave, even though he knew that he would probably just come after him again. The words he spoke to Saul in chapter 24 were probably running through his head. These are from verses 12 through 15 in chapter 24. He says, Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, for my hand shall not be against you, as the proverb of the ancient says, Wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog, a flea? Therefore let the Lord be judge, and judge between you and me, and see and plead my case, and deliver me out of your hand. See, he was on the right track. He was definitely a man of faith, but how long would God allow him to be pursued? See, it's easy to have faith sometimes in a moment, but boy, does it get hard when something is prolonged, right? Then we start to say, now hold on just a second. I thought I heard that you knew everything that happened, God. But it seems like you've been missing a few chapters. This has been going on way too long. And we get impatient, don't we? Well, I'm sure the devil relentlessly tempted David to think maybe he had made a mistake by letting Saul go in chapter 24. Maybe it was actually really was God's providence to put Saul in the cave. Maybe, maybe he really was going to make David the hand to bring justice to the kingdom. I imagine the devil was really getting on his case and making him doubt his choice to let him go. You see, David had been running from Saul a very long time, and it was beginning to wear on him. When things are prolonged, they wear on us. Our humanity is only so strong sometimes. So what would he do? He had an army to think of. You know he had his own army, right? He had his own army. And, but see, these people were loyal to him, but how long were they going to be loyal if they were going hungry? So he had to find food for this army. What would he do? Thinking and thinking and thinking, ah, that's right. Nabal lives around here. Yeah, maybe I'll go and ask him for help. See, it was sheep shearing time after all. Now, for us, that doesn't mean a thing. Because I don't know how many of you have just recently sheared sheep, but I haven't. I've actually never sheared a sheep. I'd like to try it sometime, but I haven't. I don't have sheep. It's not something that we know about today. But on this feast day, people were more generous than they usually were because it was a time to celebrate the gain and, and livestock and crops. So people were would give to other people who didn't have as much as they did. It was a very normal thing. If you asked for some help on this day for someone who had plenty, that they would, that they would give you some of their surplus. So Nabal was in the sheep sharing time. He was a rich man. And David heard that he was doing this and said, maybe I'll send some guys over and ask for this help. This is in chapter 25 verses 6 through 8. And David says, he was a pretty good diplomat, he said, now gentlemen, when you go, I want you to say this, peace be to you, peace to all your house, and peace to all you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers, and when your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give us whatever comes to your hand, to your servants, and your son, David. Wow. Man, what a humble request. You see, what the messengers said were true. David had sympathized with those shepherds. And if you remember his story, he had been a shepherd. And so he saw these poor guys out there and he remembered what it was like to lie down on the cold ground with the sheep, having to wake up often and, and to make sure they were okay, that no sheep were missing, no wild animals were attacking them, and not to mention the danger of thieves who would want to beat up or kill the shepherds to take their sheep. You see, the danger of thieves was particularly high in Paris. 
and the people who lived there were more violent than normal. So the shepherds won a soft spot in David's heart. He decided to protect them in their herds. He used his men to protect them so that nothing at all happened to them. They didn't miss one sheep. They didn't get hurt at all. It was like he used his own personal army just to protect them out of the goodness of his heart. They could have peace of mind knowing that nothing would happen to them. So David, what he said was true. He had done a great work for Nabal. I mean, anyone in their right mind would have been grateful and had given abundance even before having to be asked. Have you done something for somebody that was that you didn't have to do? Maybe you went out of your way to do something nice for them. And you didn't expect to do anything, get anything in return, probably. But if you can imagine doing something for someone, and then all of a sudden you came on hard times and you went to ask something, some help from them, what would you expect? You would expect it would probably be reasonable for them to give you a helping hand back, right? Well, that end of the message, please give whatever you have to your servants and your son David. He's asking so humbly and surely no one, no one could refuse such a wonderful and humble request like that, right? Well, except they didn't know that Nabal was a very harsh and badly behaved man. He looked in disgust, and we can see what he says in verses 10 and 11. Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away from their master. Talking about him running away from Saul. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men when I do not know where they are from? Wow. That was basically awful. The servants were shocked. Because of course they knew. He knew who David was. How could, how could you not know who David was? He knew exactly who he was. He was just spitting in David's face after he had helped him so generously. And now the servants had to go back and tell David what had happened. And I bet you they knew that their commander was quite stressed. And probably wouldn't take this so well. I don't like having to give bad news, especially if I know it's not going to go well. And this was going to be on top of everything that had already happened. How do you feel when things keep piling up on you? How do you feel when it seems like this bad thing happens, and then 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 somebody... And then that's why when somebody just happens to brush past you and maybe say something a little uh, impatient that all of a sudden you can explode like a nuclear bomb and then say, boy, why did I do that? It's because you have been getting crushed under a load of stress. This can happen to us. Well, when they told David what Nabal had said, he snapped. Just absolutely snapped. It was the last straw. How are you on your last straw moment? Can you think of a last straw moment you've had? Maybe some of you are like right there. You're right there. And the straw is just getting ready to come down on you. The last straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. I don't really think any of us is at our prime at the last straw moment. I don't think we're very patient, usually. We surely don't accept affliction with joy when it's our last straw moment, even though that's what we would hopefully do. No, it's, it's quite tough. And this was it for David. The launch button on that nuclear missile was pressed. And it started to go up. See, he had been through too much. Saul kept hunting him, even though he was 100% innocent and even spared his life when he could have murdered him in the cave. 
He had to hide in the wilderness, which isn't very fun. I mean, it's not like he had nice tents from REI, you know. He didn't have a nice cabin professionally made with a wood stove to keep him warm, no. He just probably had a mat in the ground, and it got cold sometimes. And now this guy, this guy, Nabal, wouldn't even show him kindness after all the things he had done for him. No. You see, this was the last straw. He had suffered too much, and David told everyone to grab their swords and head to Nabal's house, and they were going to wipe out everybody. Now, I want you to just put this in today's context, okay? We, we, we usually brush over stuff like this and say, yeah, that's the Bible and David, and David's great, and everything's fine. But how would you feel about somebody who had a last straw moment, you knew them, you knew they believed in God, and they said, all right, everybody, let's go, get your guns, we're going to go wipe out everybody over in this neighborhood. Does that really sound like a, a person who's <coughs> got it together? Does that sound like a good response? Wow. Sometimes we really don't think about the gravity of what some of these characters are doing. And this was God's anointed person. He's going to be his anointed king of Israel, even though he wasn't king at the moment. He had been anointed by Samuel. And here he was going to go wipe out a whole group of people. This is a big group of people, friends. Wow. So I just want to tell you, as a little aside, boy, we should have patience with one another. If God can have patience with this guy who is going to go murder a bunch of people, I think we can have a few, a little bit of patience with each other, can't we, for the things that we do? <laughs> I'm sure will. So he told them, let's go and wipe them all out. But just to feel what David was feeling, I want you to just put yourself in his circumstance. Imagine the President of the United States, now it doesn't matter who it is, just imagine the President of the United States is personally hunting you down with his military. Drones and helicopters and soldiers with machine guns and stuff. Yeah, you've been fleeing and hiding from place to place, you're hungry, you're tired, and you're quite frustrated because you're totally innocent. Now imagine that during this time, out of the goodness of your heart, you and the guys with you, just happen to be near the assets of a very wealthy person, and you just decide that you want to help the guys running security because, boy, you, maybe you've been a security guard before, and you just know how stressful it can be running security, and so you just help them out. Well, then it's Christmas. We just had Christmas, so it's easy to think about this. It's Christmas, and you're on hard times, obviously, and you just decide to go to this guy and say, boy, you know what, it's Christmas, and, you know, I just was kind of helping you out, and, and I'm just wondering, you know, could you, could you just give us some food? I mean, we just don't have anything to eat. And would that be all right? And then after all of that that you've been through, that they just slap you in the face and say, I'm not giving you anything. Who are you anyway? That would be really soul crushing. You see, David and his men couldn't take any more. And here they were. God, it was a couple hundred men. 300, they were marching to Nabal's house. Now, luckily, there were a few people that weren't so crazy at Nabal's house. You see, Abigail, his wife, was discerning and wise. Now, ladies, don't extrapolate too much from this. We're not all fools, okay? We can be sometimes, but not. we're not all fools like this guy, okay? But Abigail was very discerning and wise. And the servants told her what was going to happen. They knew Nabal was so foolish and worthless, you couldn't do anything with him. You couldn't talk any sense into him. So they urged Abigail to make something right. And now she was a woman of action. Let me tell you what. I'm just going to tell you all the things that she got together while this death group were coming to them. She got 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five prepared sheep, 35 quarts of grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and put them on two donkeys. Wow. I feel tired. Can we all take a nap? She got some servants and quickly sent out to intercept David before he was going to reach the house. She knew, if I wait until this guy gets here, it's over. i got to get him when he's on the way. i gotta, I got to just see this last-ditch effort before he wipes us all out. I know he's going to do it. So, 
Abigail was on her way. And David says to himself, in verses 21 and 22, you can just hear the fuming of his anger. Now David had said, surely in vain have I protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing missed of all that belongs to him, and he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so, and more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Now that was an oath. He just took an, he just took an oath. <laughs> he was so angry. Have you ever said anything in anger that later you said, oh dear, I shouldn't have said that. Now I'm quite embarrassed. Said something rash in the heat of your emotion. And then, oh, that was a bad choice. Well, he did. <laughs> and so he was just taking this oath. An oath that he was for sure going to kill at least every man at this place. Every man. And if you can imagine, this, this is better than any movie that could be made, guys. <laughs> that just at this moment where he is vowing this as he's walking with all of his men at his back, powerful, nothing can stop him. Here comes this beautiful woman riding up with some servants on some donkeys. If God does, then David did no male alive. What? And he sees this person coming as he's saying this oath and wondering, who is this? And what she does is she hops right off of the donkey, runs to his feet, and bows down before him. Now, men, let's not extrapolate this too much. <laughs> That's one for you. But she goes and bows down to his feet. And I imagine here he is with this army and just kind of stops and, and is totally thrown off. What? Hi. <laughs> what would you say? I don't know. And then, shockingly, she accepts all the responsibility for everything that had happened. All of it. She said, please, forgive me. Don't pay any attention. Now, that's her husband. <laughs> but she knows he's crazy. Don't pay any attention to that man named Because he is as his name is basically and incidentally Nabal means fool so he his name was fool so what do you expect you know and she asks him to forgive this trespass done and accept the provisions she brought as a gift and see then not only is she amazing in this regard but being so discerning and wise she gets to the heart of the issue she knew just where to go. And she says some very excellent things in verses 28 through 31. She says, Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will surely make my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Now, there was some evil in him. He was just going to go kill a bunch of people, mm -hmm. okay? But sometimes it's much more powerful to speak of people as we know they can be. Amen. Instead of speaking about people according to the fault that they are currently tripping up on, speak of them. Tell them, I know you are this great person. I know God is leading your life. I know that this is who you really are. This, this craziness that is happening is not you. It's not. I know that evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet, a man has risen to pursue you, Saul, and seek your life. But, my, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. Don't worry, David. Even though this seems scary, God's going to keep you alive. Don't lose faith. In the lives of your enemies, he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Man, she was good. David and Goliath, he was the guy with the sling. She's so good. Don't worry. God will be the one to sling Saul away from you. You don't have to do it, David. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief for you, 
nor offense, uh, nor offense uh, apart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause, or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Wow. She's speaking with such absolute certainty of what God is going to do for him. You see, he started to waver. Is, is God, are the promises really going to happen? I don't know anymore. And Abigail comes and says, no, they will. There is no doubt. He is going to do this for you, David. You don't have to avenge yourself. And wow, what a situation was before David now. He had just been on a mission of death and felt so justified to take out all of this anger and wrong on this fool named Nabal. But now his heart was softened by the gentle and wise words of Abigail. <coughs> Nabal might have been the straw to break the camel's back. The devil was trying to get David to go off the rails. Yeah. But then God sent a healing balm for his soul. He sent somebody to come before him and tell him, David, this is not you. And you know that God is going to fulfill the promises? Hang on. Hang on a little bit longer. And it will, he will bring it to pass. The weight of Abigail's words about the guilt that he would have felt really weighed on him, I imagine. Because when he realized, wow, how would I feel if when I become king of Israel, I remember how I slaughtered a bunch of people. Not only Nabal, but all these innocent men who were just his workers and family. It would have put such a stain on the great things God had planned for him. There would have been such guilt and sorrow mingled with the blessing. She didn't say that the blessing wouldn't still happen. See, sometimes that happens. If we do things ourselves, God still gives us the great thing that He was going to give us, but then we just regret that we didn't trust all the way through. Well, the story doesn't end there. You see, David accepts the gift and says, Wow, thank you for getting my head back on straight. I'm going to go, I'm not going to hurt you. So Abigail goes back. You imagine, she's probably, whew, the adrenaline's pumping. <laughs> I was just before hundreds of guys with swords, and everything's okay. Thank you, Lord. And she goes up and finds Nabal. And what is he doing? He's in this drunken feast with all this revelry. <coughs> and I just imagine her just walking in in some kind of face like, you know, you know that face, right? You've done that before, probably, or hopefully no one's done it to you. Later that night, she saw him like that. And when she saw him like that, she said, I'm not even gonna, he's not even going to understand what I'm going to say, so I'm going to wait until morning. And she tells him in the morning when he is trying to get over his hangover and he's a little bit more sober and can grasp the gravity of this. She tells him what was almost the result of his foolishness. And it says, his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. That's what it said. Now, I'm not a medical person, okay? I may work in a hospital, but I am not a medical person. I am the spiritual and emotional guy, okay? Not the body. I just know that he had a major medical event. Something happened. I don't know if he had a stroke. I don't know what happened. Some kind of heart attack. He, something happened to him. And ten days later, he died. He died. When David heard the news, he just realized, wow, God, you kept me from taking things into my own hands and you avenged me. Thank you. Thank you, God. <laughs> How much more wonderful is this that you have, you have done it? I don't have to feel guilty. David had to learn a really hard lesson that I think we all have to learn. Trusting God in the times when we are so 
crushed and broken and stressed. Trusting God at the time when the last straw has come and breaks the camel's back. Trusting God when the only thing we can think about is avenging ourselves. Taking the reins. Because obviously we think in our confusion, he's not leading things right. I got to do it now. And I'm going to take care of it. But that only needs to root.